Thank you, Colleen. So today, I want to try and explain to you why I think cognitive science might help to save the world. Uh, no, that sounds a little bit pretentious, uh, so bear with me. Um, so a lot of thinkers, Karen Armstrong uh, being one of them, are proposing that we're in a second axial age. And that's a pretty bold thing to say because of how dramatic the first axial age was. The first axial age is around 800 to 300 BCE. And what's happening at that time is a fundamental change in human self-understanding, the understanding of the world. You get the invention of many of the world religions. You get the invention of philosophy. You get the invention of science. You get the invention of universalistic moral codes. And that's happening in sort of four parts in the world, probably maybe five. But it's at least, we know, happening in ancient Greece. It's happening in ancient Israel, ancient India, and ancient China. Now, what's going on there is it looks like it was being in part driven by the invention of a bunch of psychotechnologies. Now, what do I mean by a psychotechnology? Well, just like a physical tool is designed to fit the human body and enhance its performance, a psychotechnology is an information processing tool or technique that is designed to fit the mind and enhance its performance. So what are some of the psychotechnologies that were being invented at this time? The first is alphabetic literacy. And this makes literacy a lot more widespread and a lot easier to use. Uh, the second is coinage. Um, it, and it's an abstract symbol system. And it brings numeracy along for the ride, which is two powerful uh, ways of training thinking. You've got also the training of various mindfulness psychotechnologies, meditation, contemplation, yoga, in which people are sort of getting a grasp on their own way they're directing attention. And then what you also have is very complex social organization. And this social complexification is allowing brains to network together such that they can solve problems that they couldn't previously solve before. So what's going on here, right, in a psychotechnology is the mind is learning how to appropriate itself. So think again about literacy. So look what I can do with literacy. I can write my thoughts down, and I can literally look at my own thinking. And I can leave it and come back with another perspective and improve it. I can share it with other people and incorporate their thinking readily into mine. And I can store a lot of the information outside of my own head, thereby massively increasing the amount of information I can keep on hand. Think about how much your problem solving and your ability to work in the world would be reduced if I took literacy from you. That's what a psychotechnology does for you. So what's going on, right, is there's a shift with the, these psychotechnologies. There's a shift from learning in which people are primarily paying attention to patterns in the world, and the increase in what they can do is quite incremental, to them stepping back and being able to look at their own learning, to doing learning to learn, to learning about their own learning and learning how to intervene in it. So they get those aha moments, those moments of realization when they can lead to sudden and important changes in our competence for interacting with the world. Now, that learning to learn and a lot of the attendant abilities that were going with the psychotechnologies were being basically co-opted by some very significant figures who were using that to create strategies Strategies for the cultivation of wisdom, where wisdom had come to mean an important kind of self-transcendence that would help in some way to give people some important realizations and insights such that they could address the suffering and the violence that was being created in the Axial Age because of that social complexification and the rapid commercialization that was associated with it. So why might we be in a second ax axial age. Like, what are the parallels? Well, think about it. We've got globalization going on. We have massive commercialization. We have a rapid increase in technology, especially communications technology. And what that's leading to is an unparalleled social complexification. But that's bringing with it a an attendant set of crises that seem to be indicating that we're on a tipping point. We're at a point where a significant change is about to occur. What are these crises? Well, they're all too unfortunately familiar to us. There's an economic crisis that seems to be like it's going to be ongoing. There's a looming energy crisis. There's an environmental crisis. And on top of it all, there's an existential crisis which is growing in power. As a lot of people are finding 
that the religious and philosophical foundations that were laid down in the Axial Age are now collapsing for them. But it doesn't mean their spiritual hunger has gone away. But there's an information glut combined with a wisdom famine. I mean, if I ask you, where do you go for information? You know, you say, I go to the internet. Where do you go for knowledge? Well, I turn to science or I go to the university. If you ask people, where do you go for wisdom and self-transcendence? There's often a poignant pause. But we need wisdom because there's good reason to believe that these crises are not independent, that they're interacting and then they're exacerbating each other. And there's a very good chance that they might spiral out of control. We might face an exponential cataclysm. And we need wisdom because we need, we need insight. We've got to break out of this thinking we're in. We're, there's a growing sense that the old ways of trying to think and solve the problems aren't working anymore. We need the self-regulation that is so central to wisdom. Because we're going to have to discipline ourselves to pursue difficult goals and long-term goals. But just when we need wisdom most, we find a dearth of wisdom because there's no significant cultural or institutional support for it. But it's not all lost. Because that networking of things together has also meant that various disciplines are networking together. That's what cognitive science is. It's a networking together of neuroscience and psychology, artificial intelligence and linguistics and philosophy to create this super science to try and understand this amazingly complex machine in our head. And we're having some very significant success. What's even more interesting and relevant to our talk is that cognitive science is turning to the topic of wisdom itself. First, it's giving us a view of what wisdom is as a whole. It's this self-appropriation of the mind that affords a significant kind of self-transcendence. But cognitive science is also giving us deep insight into the components of wisdom. What are the component cognitive processes? Two of those are ones I've mentioned, very central. One is insight. To be wise, you have to see through something misleading. You have to discern what really matters. And you have to self-regulate because you have to shape yourself to follow what really matters. Now, interestingly enough, cognitive science is studying these two things. So how do you go about studying insight? So one of the most famous ways we do it is we give a problem. This is called the nine-dot problem. Uh, my students make fun of me because at every talk I give, I seem to talk about the nine-dot problem at some point. Um, so what you have to do is you have to join um, all nine dots with four straight lines. And the next line has to come from the end of the previous line. Many people initially frame this as a very easy problem. They start trying to do it, and then they fail, and then they do it again, and they fail, and they do it again, and they fail. And then they come to realize, oh, this is a really hard problem. In fact, it's a very hard problem. The rate at which people solve this problem spontaneously, that means, means without any aid, statistically is around 0%. So if you really want to you know, sort of piss somebody off, give them this problem. <laughs> okay. So, and it's because you have to act to solve this problem, you have to actually break that frame. You have to break it. You have to alter your attention, and you have to change what you consider relevant and salient. And when you give most people the solution, they get upset. They say, you cheated. You went outside the box or the square. Of course, at no point when I set up the problem did I say box or square to you. And here's something really interesting. This is, these are the experiments where think outside the box comes from. That's where that phrase comes from. Here's what's even more ironic. Saying to people, think outside the box, doesn't help them with this problem. <laughs> For very, very good reason. This is not a matter of knowing that you have to go outside the box. It's a matter of knowing how to go outside the box. You need a psychotechnology. You need to teach people how to break frame and make more appropriate framing. And what we can do, what we've just begun to do, is we can teach them some of these breaking frame and making frame techniques, and we can improve insight. But you could do something even more interesting. You could do something a little bit more higher order. You could teach people to do learning to learn on their own framing. 
so that they step back and become aware of their framing. So they increase the cognitive flexibility by which they can break frame and make frame. Now it turns out that that psychotechnology is the axial age technology of mindfulness. If you train people in mindfulness, what we've got is increasing experimental evidence that you increase their cognitive flexibility and you can dramatically increase their ability to solve insight problems. Well, what about self-regulation? How would we study self-regulation? Well, one of the ways we do this is with a design called the delay of gratification paradigm. It's also known as the marshmallow test because we initially did this with kids. And this is how the test goes. You bring the child in and you put a marshmallow in front of them and you say, you can have the marshmallow whenever you want, but the longer you wait, the greater the chance I'll give you a second marshmallow. And then you time them. It's a little bit cruel, isn't it? Little kid. <laughs> right? Now what's really interesting about this is that ability to delay gratification is really predictive of a lot of things. It seems to predict how well you're going to do in school, it seems to predict how well you're going to do in your professional life, your social relations, possibly even your interpersonal relations, independent of measures of your IQ. Self-regulation really matters. Can we give people psychotechnologies for improving self-regulation? You bet we can. What we can teach the kid to do, for example, is when you look at the marshmallow, don't look at the marshmallow as a whole. Look at just the color, the whiteness. Or look at the fact that the marshmallow's like a white, fluffy cloud. Or even more interestingly, think about this. Pretend you're putting a frame around the marshmallow, and all you're really doing is looking at a picture of a marshmallow. I mean, you're literally teaching the kids to break frame, right? And that really increases their ability to delay gratification. The thing is, self-regulation isn't just a matter, though, of delay, delaying gratification, because you don't want to just delay gratification all the time, right? That's some sort of Protestant hell you get trapped in or something, <laughs> right? So instead, right, you have to know when and where and to what degree you want to delay gratification. And that requires doing the opposite. It requires making frame. You have to expand your scope of attention, expand your scope of awareness, your sense of identity, so that your current self, with its current goals, is in conjunction in your mind with your future self and the, those long-term goals. So you know when those goals are in conflict, and you know where and when and to what degree you should exercise delay of gratification. So self-regulation seems to be also enhanced by teaching people how to break frame and make frame. But given that mindfulness can enhance those, we would predict that training in mindfulness can also enhance self-regulation. And we're getting increasing experimental evidence that that, in fact, is the case. We even have some neuroanatomical evidence that seems to indicate that areas concerned with regulation, especially self-regulation, are actually thickening under right, the conditions of people practicing long-term mindfulness practices. So look at what we got here. We've got a potential constellation of psychotechnologies. We could, you know, organize them all together so that they were mutually supporting, so that we could fundamentally transform, you know, consciousness and cognition and thereby alter character and community. But it's, it's even more interesting than that, because the cognitive science isn't just giving us a, a lot about the psychotechnologies. The cognitive science is starting to create cyber technologies. Now, what do I mean by a cyber technology? A cyber technology is any external device that's designed to directly interact with the brain and alter its performance. So some of the most important of these are neurofeedback, a kind of biofeedback that's done on the brain. Uh, TMS, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, you're basically using electromagnetic pulse to, pulses to shut off and on areas of the brain to change performance. And TDCS, which is transcranial direct current stimulation, you're putting a weak electrical current on the skull. Now recently, two scientists, Chai and Snyder, they took a look at the neuroscience of insight. They took a look at how neural activity is being shifted around in the brain when you have that aha moment. And the thing you can do with TDCS is you can actually alter the probability of such neuronal shifting occurring. So what they did was they created what's called a montage, a way of using TDCS, to increase the chance that you get the neuronal shifting that happens during insight. And then they gave people insight problems to solve. And they were able to triple people's ability to solve insight problems. Even more recently, just last year, 
they went back to the dreaded nine dot problem. Remember the spontaneous solution rate is 0%? They put this montage on people, gave them the nine dot problem, and the spontaneous solution rate went up to 40%. Now you would think that since self-regulation and insight use a lot of the same underlying cognitive machinery, that we could use some of these cyber technologies to also enhance self-regulation. And we're getting significant evidence for both TDCS and neurofeedback being able to do that. Now we have the possibility here for a really significant dynamical loop. We can use psychotechnologies to reveal power and potential about cognition that we didn't realize we had. We can then thereby better design cyber technologies for enhancing that, which can thereby right, ramp up the psychotechnologies and so on and so on, until the cyber technologies and the psychotechnologies more and more integrate together, until we might actually get cyborg technologies, relatively permanent cognitive prosthetics that enhance our performance. Now that's a lot more plausible than you might think, and it's a lot closer. We've already got some in the lab. Why is it more plausible? Well, there was a surprising thing. When they started to do this brain-computer interface, they initially assumed, you know what? The computer's going to have to have this massive program. It's going to be so sophisticated, and you're going to have to map the brain in this really complex, invasive, and it's going to be so hard and so hard and so hard. And that turned out to be wrong for a lot of people for a very interesting reason. It turns out what the brain does is it starts to design itself to fit the interface. It tries to fit itself and appropriate it. It optimizes itself for the interface. And it looks like it does this for two very good reasons. The first is one made famous by Nor Norman Doidge. The brain changes itself. The brain's plastic. Your brain isn't a single static machine. It's a machine of machines that can make itself into a new kind of machine. It's an inherently self-complexifying, self-transcending organ. The second reason is that we're wired for culture. Our brains evolved to hybridize themselves, to fit themselves to external technologies, to external psychotechnologies. The brain often even will wrap your sense of identity around a tool. Think about what happens when you try and do parallel parking. <laughs> now this presents a really unique opportunity for us. Typically what happens is when we get a technology that can really change things, like we just sort of bumble along and hope and we make mistakes and ah, and these technologies have terrific potential, but also terrific risk associated with them. Think of the power to intervene in people's minds that is coming into our hands. But think also of this opportunity, what we have here. Because what we have is the opportunity to simultaneously develop the technology and create the wisdom to use it. And those two can feed on each other. The wisdom can improve how we use these technologies, which can enhance the wisdom, which can improve how we use the technologies. And that can spiral. And perhaps that spiral is the best chance we have of dealing with the threat that all these crises facing us might spiral out of control. The chance that we might have this ongoing, self-transcending wisdom that could afford us to rise to the challenge of meeting this, that's what I mean by neural enlightenment. And the realization of such neural enlightenment would be the epitome of a second axial age. And that's how cognitive science could perhaps save the world. Thank you very much.